This is your Kick-Ass Life Podcast, episode number 236 with guest Sarah Dean. This is the Your Kick-Ass Life Podcast with Andrea Owen, a no BS guide to self-help and badassery. Because ladies, let's face it, life's too short for it to not kick ass. And here's your host, the girl who serves it up straight with a side of crazy, Andrea Owen. Hey there, ass kickers. What's up? It's July. I hope you're having a great summer. And of course, thank you so much for being here. I'm curious, is your schedule turned upside down? I know that for many people who have either your teachers and you have summers off or you have kids and the summers get crazy, or maybe your job is just different in the summer. Maybe your podcast listening routine has been thrown for a loop. I don't know. I know that most people, well, not most people, but a lot of people have regular podcast episodes that they listen to on certain days. I'm not really like that. I just like whenever I have time, I'm either listening to an audiobook or a podcast or something like that. I'm not that regimented, but I know a lot of you are. So I just, I, I wonder like, it does the summer like throw everything off for some people? Maybe, maybe not. I wanted to remind you that we are in full swing over at the YKAL Patreon party. This has just recently been rolled out. It's a way for the show to be supported by y'all. Whether you want to pledge a dollar an episode or more, there are bonuses over there. And again, I don't want anybody to panic. Like the podcast will always be free, but Patreon has given us the opportunity to have the production costs be supported as well as a place, a platform, if you will, for me to give you more than just the podcast back. There's all kinds of different bonuses, you can head over to patreon.com slash Y-K-A-L and read all about it. There's a fancy video in there from me. It's not that fancy, but I do have lipstick on in that particular video. But over there, you can read about the different tiers of pledging and the bonuses that you get with each one. I'm excited because next week is our first Um, Ask Me Anything video where I'm going to be on live on video with all the pledges and my dog's going to be there too and it's going to be an Ask Me Anything extravaganza. There's bonus content involved and there's all kinds of stuff, bonuses and perks for you to get if you decide to become a patron. So that's patreon.com slash YKAL. The other announcement I have for you is that very soon like next week or so, in the middle of July, I'm going to be opening up applications for the mentorship. This is my fall program that is a virtual retreat, meaning you get to stay at home. You don't have to travel to come to me. And all you need is an internet connection and some privacy. We are going to go through the Daring Way curriculum. That is the modality that I am certified in based on the work of Dr. Brene Brown on shame resilience and connection and vulnerability and learning better coping mechanisms, self-compassion, empathy, et cetera, et cetera, as well as three months of support afterwards. That looks like um, weekly calls with the group and me that are all structured, one-on-one support from me, a forum with the other women in the group. It is limited to 12 women. So if you want to be first, to know about it and read all of the details and possibly fill out an application, you can head over to yourkickasslife.com slash mentorship and you'll be the first to know about it. Again, it's application based and I'm really excited about it. It's just, I've wanted to create a way for us all to come together to be able to do this work that works for everyone. Because I know sometimes you can't work with me privately or you can't travel to come to one of my in-person retreats. So I feel like this is the solution for that. It's for anyone who is ready to do the work. Like I always say, you're probably the person who has read all the books and listened to all the podcasts. You follow all the right people, quote unquote, on social media, and you want to actually put your personal development into work and practice. Really, that's what this is all about. I have no doubt that if you do this program, it will absolutely change your life for the better. Yourkickasslife.com slash mentorship. And we have Sarah Dean on the podcast today. I was on her podcast when I was doing my, my podcast tour for my book launch of How to Stop Feeling Like Shit. And she and I got along so swimmingly, like instant friends. We joke that we both talk 
talk as fast. She's like, I finally met someone who talks as fast as I do. You guys, like when I do these intros, I specifically try to slow down because my normal pace of talk, (laughs) it runs away from me so fast. It's like a 7.5 on the treadmill. I guess that's actually not that fast for some people, but I, I really do try to slow down. But Sarah Dean definitely matches me in energy and I love her. I am sure that you will too. So let me tell you a little bit about her before we jump into the conversation. Sarah Dean is the creator and host of the Shameless Mom Academy podcast, which has been featured in five categories of iTunes, new and noteworthy for almost two years now, and is a rapidly approaching 1 million downloads. Sarah's biggest passion is helping women own their space. After enduring her own identity crisis following the birth of her son, Sarah took her background in psychology, health, wellness, and rebuilt her identity one step at a time. Sarah motivates and inspires women to stop shrinking and start growing. She is on a mission to inspire women and moms in particular to live bigger, bolder, braver every damn day. So without further ado, here is Sarah. Sarah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be with someone who talks as fast as I do. (laughs) I was just, I was just <laughs> interviewing Amber Ray, who's, you know, another guest on the podcast. And it was the same. We, we like whipped through the whole podcast in like 25 minutes. I was like, great. Somebody who talks as fast and is <laughs> as efficient as I am. So, I know it's all about efficiency. <laughs> Let's get her done. No, you had me on your podcast when I was promoting my book. And of course that link will be in the show notes. And we had such a great conversation. I was like, you have to come on my show because I resonate so much. We agreed on so many things. And of course I only want to have people on who agree with the things that I agree with. And (laughs) right, right. just keep it really simple, (laughs) clean, simple, homogenous. (laughs) I'm kidding. But I just, again, we, we shared, you know, some of the same story and things like that. And I just resonated with you so much and wanted to introduce you to my community. So welcome And we were chatting a little bit before we started recording, and I wanted to ask you, because this has been kind of a theme, you know, this year in 2018, as I've just, you know, on my own journey in personal development and people that don't know my background is in fitness, but I want to ask you before I get too much into making it about me. So what it, cause you made a pivot, you made a professional pivot mm-hmm. out of the fitness industry and into a more kind of supportive environment for women and, and launching the Shameless Mom Academy. So tell us about that. Like what happened and, and what did you do and what was the kind of philosophy behind that? Yeah. So I've been in the fitness industry for 16 years as a personal trainer. And then I had, I've always had my own business. I've owned my own facility since 2012. And it's been amazing. I will say I've worked with thousands of women locally and online who have completely changed my life as I've been part, been able to participate in their transformations. And I thought that was really, really cool. I still think that's really cool that I got to do that. It was an honor and a privilege to be in that space with so many women. But after I had my son, I went through a lot of body image issues myself. Like body image has just always been a thing for me, mm-hmm. something that I've struggled with. When I got back into this place that felt tough after my son was born, and just motherhood in general felt tough, like completely kicked my ass. Yeah. Um, so it was like extra weight was only like one of the pieces that was like making yeah. me feel worthless. But so when I found myself back in that space, I was like constantly aware of here I've built this successful business model and it's all around helping women shrink. And like one of the biggest ways that I got new members into our gym and really fueled them um, and got them really excited was through transformation. And all those transformations were through weight loss and through shrinking and through taking up less space and getting lean. I always was talked about like getting leaner and meaner, like, and a lot of that was positive and help people find their power, but it was still all about helping women get smaller. And when women, and I even changed messaging over time where I was like, this isn't going to be about weight loss. It's just going to be about like helping you own your power and feel physically strong and all this. But women still came in and I would say all that stuff and feel like way better about it. Like I've changed my messaging. So now it doesn't feel icky, but women still came in and would look in the mirror and be like, but can you help me with this, like this belly fat right here and this roll here? And it was still just constantly picking themselves apart. So that was a huge reason that I started my podcast. I launched the Shameless Mom Academy because I was like, okay, in one world here, I'm helping women shrink. So now I have this like 
ethical responsibility to be in another world, helping women grow and expand and take up space. And as I got deeper into that, I was like, this is it. This is where I want to be. I want to be full-time in the Shameless Mom Academy, helping women grow, take up space, like be, find their badassery and own it at any size, any shape, anything. And, and I can't ethically sell shrinking anymore. And so I sold my gym and it was like a profitable, multiple six figure business. And I, so I, I listed it like while it was doing really, really well. And my husband was like, what? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Are you sure? (laughs) Like, he goes, if anyone can do this and do it well, it's going to be you, but are you really? (laughs) Oh man. Yeah. Conversation. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But we did, I did it. And I have, I was a little nervous at first. Um, the process took a little while and there was some hiccups along the way, which kept reinforcing to me that I wanted it to happen. Like when we had hiccups along the way, I was like, Oh my gosh, what if this doesn't happen? Like, what if I am stuck in this business? And again, not a bad business, but just didn't, wasn't a good fit for me yeah, anymore. Wasn't in a line uh, anymore. Yeah. And so I just, I mean, so we closed about a month ago and it's been like the weight of the world off my shoulders, just knowing that I can be in a, a, a space that I just feel so much more positive about. And I feel like I can impact lives in a, just a really, uh, in such a different way than I have been the last 16 years. So I'm, I'm really, really excited about that. It's yeah. It, in a different way. I like that you chose that word because I still feel really uncomfortable talking about this because, <laughs> because it's such a, I, I feel like it's a heavy topic and I don't, I don't think like, I want to just say first and foremost, I don't think the fitness industry is inherently bad. Right. I think that, of course, we want to be our best selves so that we can live long lives and and um, and be participants in it physically, emotionally, mentally, and all of these things. And, you know, excuse me as I kind of like work my way through what I'm trying to say and, and step in shit along the way. But I recorded, and, and, you know, this will be in the show notes too. My friend Kate Anthony and I recorded two episodes months ago about our own journeys through this. And, and in, in those episodes, I tell the story, but for context... I have a degree in exercise physiology. I love, love fitness. I love, Yeah, it's amazing to me how we are put together as human beings. Like anatomy and physiology fascinates me to no end. And then the exercise part of it, like how we, how we are working machines. And it's just, it's, it's always been incredible to me and quick story, how I actually was first fascinated by it. I have a history, a familial history of high blood pressure and heart disease. And early on I had high blood pressure, went to go see a nutritionist at a hospital And she was talking to me about trans fats. This was back in probably the mid, maybe late nineties. And I was like, what does that even mean? You know? And she's like kind of explaining it. And I was like, will you draw it for me? Like, how is this bad in the arteries? And she was like, no one's ever asked me that before. So she was drawing the molecules on a piece of paper and showing me how they stack. And I was like, done. I am so sold and interested in that. I love science. That led me to my degree in kinesiology. And I was actually going to double go into a double master's at San Diego state and they have a really great double master's in nutrition and exercise phys ended mm-hmm. up not doing that, but I did end up working for the American council on exercise. Great organization. I love them. Yeah. And then also was certified with them, worked for them corporately. And then also worked on the gym floor as a personal trainer for me. Here was my moment. I had all female clients because the male clients were not my favorite. It's <laughs> a different different story for a different podcast episode. But I had one particular female client who came in because her husband had bought her sessions. They were trying to conceive. And her doctor told her, if you lost 25 pounds, you might have better luck conceiving. And she was she was to me, she was, there was nothing wrong with her. Like she was, she didn't right. need to lose weight. And she just looked so sad and just, she looked defeated every time she'd come in. And I only worked with her like maybe three sessions. And I was like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't sell women on this solution that is the treadmill that is, right. you know, this, that weight loss is the solution to your problems because that's what they were coming to me for. And right. it was really difficult because again, like on one hand, I still love fitness and, and still love to be quote unquote in shape and, and challenge my, my body. And, but it was, it was, was it really hard for you? Cause it was hard for me. Like I really wrestled with it for a long time. Yes. It's really hard. And I, I agree with so much of what you said. And I really love fitness. And I actually like in the last year or so lost like 15, 18 pounds. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like here I am like telling women not to shrink, but I shrank. And like, it, so there, it's, there is this like weird, it's a very personal thing for everyone. It's complicated. Um, and mm-hmm. there is this like 
these conflicting thoughts. And I think that some people do things that really elevate the fitness level or elevate in the fitness industry and make it a really safe, amazing, powerful place for women. And I think there's a lot of people and businesses that don't do that. And so I think that you have to be really conscientious of how you enter that space as an individual Mm -hmm. and how you take in that information. And you really need to be responsible for like, even in social media, like what images do you let yourself see? And like, I actually now on social media, I don't follow fitness pages. I actually on Instagram specifically follow a ton of body positivity pages that are like, like fat girl flow and like lipstick. um, It's like curvy luscious lips and curvy hips or something like that. But it's literally, and it's like women who are like 200, 300 pounds Mm -hmm. and they're, they look amazing. And I am completely impressed and in awe of women taking up space in that way and looking so beautiful and so confident. And that's what I want to be a part of. So at the same time, like I want to feel a certain way in my own skin. And I know I feel that way at a certain weight with a certain amount of muscle. And so I understand all of what you're saying. I don't think it's wrong to have a weight loss goal. I don't think it's wrong to want a certain kind of body, but also that can't be your top priority in life. And I think that most women, not most women, I shouldn't say that a lot of women, their primary goal in life over all other goals and all of their priorities is I want to lose X amount of pounds. Mm -hmm. And that takes, that's always like the thing at the top of their mind before, like I should go for this promotion. Maybe we should have another child. I want to go find the man, my dreams, all the thing that supersedes all of that is like, but first maybe I should lose 30 pounds. And we have that from the time we're like 11 yes. until we die. <laughs> and that's not, I'm not okay with that. So I'm not that okay was with that really, either. Yeah. I was like, I, that's where I can't have this be like the focal point of my business. Yeah. I see that and hear that. Yeah. And I really encourage if, if, y- if y'all haven't listened to those two episodes where Kate and I really dive deep into it. And, and again, like, I just want to reiterate that it was a personal experience that my friend and I walked through out loud on these two podcast episodes. And, and what the conclusion of it for me was, is that, cause I went through a period over the last two years where I did not work out and I gained, probably, I mean, I'm probably anywhere from like 30 or 40 pounds heavier than I was, um, 10, 15 years ago. And I'm definitely about 15 pounds heavier than I was like after I had my, my first child somewhere, somewhere around there, a couple of, couple of pant sizes for sure. And I got to a point where I was like, I'm so done, like jumping on the next, like whole 30, but it's not a diet right. or whatever. <laughs> It's a lifestyle. Keto, but it's not a diet. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm not going to do, you know, like an, an actual diet where I'm restricting because I come from history of an eating disorder. But, you know, it's like to me, that is like swimming in shark infested water, you know, just playing with fire, that type of thing. And so I had to get to a point where I was done with all of that. I gained weight and I sat with it and I had to get really curious about it. Again, this was like a two-year journey, y'all, that I did not do out loud here on the podcast (laughs) until recently, until I got to a point where my body was like, knock, knock, knock. Hey, we would like some exercise, please. Like, (laughs) it's not too much to ask. So I had to really dig deep and get to a place of, okay, am I going to be, am I okay in this size or am I okay in that size? And, and it, it's been, again, it's been a two year journey. So something interesting happened. This was kind of funny as I have started, I signed up for a triathlon is what happened. And I really had to, to think about that. Like, is this okay for me and get really curious and get some coaching on it and all that good stuff. But none of my running shorts fit me anymore. And these are the shorts I bought probably in like 2014. And they were like good running shorts. And I was in my bedroom and I was all mad. And my husband's like, what's the matter? And I'm like, none of my good running shorts fit me anymore. And and I was like, rah, rah about it. And he was like, he looks over at me. I, he was brushing his teeth and he's like, you could just buy different running shorts. <laughs> <laughs> that's like such the dude response. Like that's, isn't that so obvious when you say it, when you hear it out loud, but like a woman is like, well, I probably need to like start keto tomorrow and like do double workouts. Like the woman's solution is like, oh, I need to shrink to accommodate this. And the guy is like, buy bigger so shorts. just buy new shorts. Yeah. Like how, how have you not thought of that? Buy bigger <laughs> shorts. And there's so much, right. I had to buy bigger underwear too. I was telling my podcast listeners about that and how I thought there was something wrong with my underwear because, because <laughs> they kept writing up my ass and I was like, what's the matter with my underwear? All mad. And then I'm like, oh, they don't fit anymore. Like, 
<laughs> anyway, it's, I just think it's a complicated journey that everyone needs. I think the bottom line, the last thing I want to say about it is to think about how much time and energy it is taking yes. up space, thinking about and criticizing and worrying about your body and your size and your food and all of that stuff. That's what I'm curious about for women. And that's yeah. where I think, think that your journey starts. Totally. And then you would never want, you would never wish that on someone else or especially on your kids to be like, wow, I really hope my daughter spends hours a day, like begrudging her body. God, like no. most women do. No, no, <laughs> I don't never wish that on your kids. So yeah, I never, totally ever. agree. Oh yeah. I remember I read, I think it was in the book, the body myth by I think Naomi Wolf. I, I'm, I'm not totally sure. I will, I will get that shit together in the show notes, but there was a quote that says you are more than the sum of your parts. Yes. And I remember thinking, Oh my God. Like that just like hit me over the head. You are more than the sum of your parts. And that, you know, that I heard that long time ago and that sort of like opened my eyes to the media and like what we are constantly bombarded with as women Mm -hmm. and and who we need to be and what we need to be and all of these things. So that's a really, I like that story that you made that decision that that was probably not an easy one to to, um, walk away from, you know, the successful business that you'd put a lot of blood, sweat and tears in. No, it was initially very scary. But I also know that I perform well in fear. <laughs> what do you mean <laughs> by that's that? Something I've, that's something I've, what was that? I, what do you mean by that? I, I'm curious. So, yeah. So uh, I am someone who grew up only doing things I was really good at where I could get straight A's. And if there was extra credit, I would also need to get a straight A on the extra credit. Yeah. And so I was a very high achiever. I did not play sports because I didn't think I was athletic. And also I didn't, number one, I didn't want to fail. I didn't want to fail in front of other people. And number two, I did not want to let down a team. Right. So my, my extracurricular was getting straight A's and I never understood how like these kids who played sports, like couldn't prioritize their studies. And why so, would anyone turn down extra credit? Like, right. That to I me know. Was like, like you get like 104%. <laughs> well, it's like insurance. <laughs> totally. Totally. When I was making decisions in my young adulthood, a lot of it was around like, okay, like what's the thing that I'm good at and what's the thing I can go in and it'll be like the perfect fit so that I can already go in like immediately being successful and understanding it and all those things. And what I learned when I went back to school, so I, my college, uh, my college degree is in sociology with a minor in psychology. And I worked with little kids in a psychiatric hospital. And when that, when that completely burned me out, which didn't take too long, I knew I wanted to go back to school. And when I went back to school, I went into personal training very quickly. When I finished school, I realized like I can make $65 an hour if I go out on my own as an independent contractor, or I can go work at like LA Fitness or 24 mm-hmm. Hour Fitness and make like $12.50 an hour. Yeah. So that was completely a no brainer to me, except for that. I didn't know anything about running a business, nor was that a goal of mine. I wanted to just make money, but I didn't want to be a business owner. I had no desire to like own my own gym and have overhead and all that stuff. What I found over the years is all of the times when I had discomfort in growing this business, those were the time, like walking into fear was where I grew and where I flourished. And also I felt, I feel like one of my gifts is walking into fear and recognizing like, here's the part that's really hard and really hurts. And how are you going to make that into a story that's worth living and be able to talk about it afterwards? And so I just did that over and over and over again. So when it came to selling the gym, I was like, okay, this is going to be scary. I don't know how it's going to turn out. I I mean, I don't even know if I can make enough money on this to make it worth my time to sell it. But also, I don't know like how I'm going to make money after this. I have mm-hmm. this podcast that I love, but it's definitely not bringing in multiple six figures a year. Yeah. <laughs> so what? Like, how am I going to manage that? So I w- was like, okay, but I know that every time I walk into fear, like my, my I up level my life in ways that I can't even imagine before I walk through it. So. So to me, really embracing change and discomfort and transition and all the things that I completely avoided for the first 25 years of my life, and like being okay with getting like maybe an 88% instead of 104%, like that's good. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Okay. This is, I feel like this has been a theme a lot with some of my guests and, and maybe it's because the universe is like, this is what you need to hear, Andrea. Um, <laughs> And my guests too. But all right. So where do you see, I know we talked about body stuff, but where else do you see women limiting themselves? And also what specific, because we love action steps. We love advice. What action right. steps can they take to live bigger lives? Yeah. So I think women, and so I work primarily with moms, obviously through the Shameless Mom Academy. And I What I see is that women um, and moms in particular feel like we need to put things on hold until like the right time, the more ideal time. I mean, 
even going back to diet culture and fitness and everything, we that's constant. Like, well, next Monday will be better or next month or next year or whatever. And we do that in so many areas of our lives where we put things on hold and think like, well, I'm going to settle for right now. And then like when the situation or the, the circumstances are a little more ideal, then I'll take the leap. But we just constantly like push out like when those circumstances can all fall into place and when we can make things picture perfect for the next thing to happen. And so I think that we need to stop waiting. And for moms, I say like, you don't need to wait until your kids go to kindergarten or to college to start building your own identity. You actually need to take radical responsibility for that right now, because you're not doing anyone a great service by putting yourself off or by like sitting in, by by settling in your life. You're being a less happy version of yourself. You're like settling for mediocrity. That doesn't make you, that doesn't help you win. And it doesn't help the people around you win. Like it doesn't, it doesn't do, it doesn't elevate anyone. Most importantly, it doesn't elevate you. So I think that it's really important that you look at like, okay, what is one uncomfortable action I can take today? And it doesn't mean that you quit your job right now that, Mm -hmm. you know, and like go back to school or do something that might be really terrifying and maybe irresponsible if you're like a breadwinner in your family. But it means that you start looking at like, okay, you know, signing up for a 5k, like that's terrifying, but I'm going to do it anyway. Going to this like networking event and talking to people I don't know terrifying, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm going to say hi to three people and I'm going to make eye contact and shake their hands firmly and not give a limp female handshake. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I'll go back up to my hotel room and hide, but I will go (laughs) and make myself do like that one uncomfortable thing. And then I'll process it afterwards and be like, okay, like I shook three hands. I look people in the eye. I gave a firm handshake and they all thought I was kind of a badass, and I didn't know that was going to feel that way. And so you do like the little hard things. And over time, that allows you to start doing the bigger hard things. And so I think it's really being conscientious of like, what is the scary thing I'm going to do today? And I talk about this a lot in my communities about taking time to plan your scary action steps every day to first thing in the morning, like have a morning routine. And I talk about my 15 minute morning manifest where you have a morning routine that involves like, here's how I want to feel today. I want to feel strong, powerful, capable, you know, patient with my kids, content, excited, exhilarated, whatever. And here's what I want to, here's, and not, here's what I want to accomplish. Here's what I will accomplish today. I will accomplish like going to the networking event, posting the scary thing on Facebook, having the uncomfortable conversation with my boss, who's making me crazy or with my neighbor, who's like offending me with their leaves falling in my yard. And I'm not just going to rake them up myself anymore, myself anymore, but I'm actually going to go knock on their door and ask them if they can help me with this. So it's all these little things where you can just say, these are the three things I will do today. I will accomplish today. And those things have to be action steps that take you closer to a goal. It's not like I'm going to check my email and do my laundry and brush my teeth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, and then I think also consistently learning from others. And so I talk about, you know, for me, personal development is reading every morning. I read out of a personal development book every evening. I read out of an autobiography. And sometimes it's like five minutes. It's mm-hmm. not like I sit and read chapter upon chapter, but I'm, and then when I'm doing laundry, making dinner, all those things, I'm listening to podcasts when I'm in the car by myself, I'm listening to podcasts. So I'm always getting information from other people to be like, Oh my gosh, look what they did. And if they can, what I've learned from this over and over is that all these things that I think fancy people are doing and people that I have up on a pedestal, all those things that they're doing, I can do because I've met a lot of these people now in person. Yeah they shit just like I do. Yeah. Like they're, no one is special. And I've been in rooms with people. Well, I've been in rooms with like some of the, you know, most successful um, online entrepreneurs and internet marketers in the world. And I've seen them cry over the exact same things that I cry about where I'm like, Oh my God, we're totally all the same. Yeah. So learning from each other, I think, and like recognizing like if, and if someone else can do something, there's no reason that you can't do the same thing. That's why I stopped putting people on pedestals a few years ago. Totally. I'm like, y'all are all the same and we, we all have the same shit. And that's why I always tell my listeners like, please, please, for the love of God, don't put me on a pedestal. <laughs> Cause right. I, I'm still going through this journey just like you are. Same, same Z's. We're all twinning here. Yes. All right. Well, I'm curious about your morning routine. I think you, you mentioned a couple of things that you yeah. do because my morning routine, I, I show this on Instagram stories, consists of me getting home from dropping off my kids and turning off all the lights in the house that they have left on. And <laughs> <laughs> I do that too. That's like a, that is, totally like a five minute event every day. Yeah. How many Closets lights can everywhere. I turn off? <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. I started laughing because I was like, this is my morning routine. It's the same every morning. <laughs> my dog follows me into the office. She knows what we're doing. It's time to work. Yeah. So right. what does what your morning routine look like? Yeah. So my morning routine starts before anyone else 
and my family is up and not like way before. Cause I don't, you know, there's definitely people who are like, get up an hour before your family and like do a, 18 activities and you'll feel great. I'm like, no, like, <laughs> I'm not, especially Sorry. working with moms. I'm not going to ask moms who already get up at like five 30 to screaming babies to get up at four 30, oh just jump through yeah. their lives. So I get up a few minutes before my son and my morning routine is I get up, I go downstairs and I built this out in a way that it's enticing to me. So I'm like, okay, I go down to the couch and there's a special blanket there. And I have a book there ready to go. If it's cold, if it's like during winter time, I'll set tea stuff out bef- the night before so that I have like tea ready to go in the morning. So I just have to heat up some water. And so then I have this like cozy little routine where I go sit on the couch with my blanket, my pillows. And I read for like five to 10 minutes. Then I journal for five to 10 minutes. I, I've done like the artist way, which is three full pages of journaling that takes yeah, me about 30 minutes. Pages. It just makes me really bitter because my arm hurts the whole time. Mm-hmm. So I don't do that anymore. I think there's a time and a place for that for sure. I think it's valuable, but I'm like, I don't need to do that. So I do like a quick journal, three to five minutes of how do I want to feel today? What will I accomplish today? What am I grateful for? And then I go in and I do about a 20 to 30 minute workout in my guest bedroom. Now I am a gym owner who does her own workouts at home in her guest bedroom (laughs) with an iPad because just because I'm a gym owner does not mean I think that it's most effective and efficient for everyone to go to a gym. Mm -hmm. So in spite of me being a gym owner for, you know, and having a fitness business for 16 years for the last five years, since I had my son, I have been working out at home in my guest bedroom with my dog sitting next to me. So that takes up about half of the space. And then my son usually wandering in and out with toys. So it's like not anything pretty or fancy. And half the time I'm annoyed. And like, I mean, right now the guest bedroom is half full of clothes we need to donate. And so I'm moving bags of clothes around in order to get to my dumbbells. And it's like, and the dog like sometimes poops on the carpet right next to me in the middle of the workout. Like it's not fancy. And I have a picture of my son like one morning the dog pooped. There's like paper towels all over the carpet. My son has a little hand vacuum and she's vac and he's vacuuming the dog while she sits there like being terrified. And I'm, and the iPad is going and I'm doing my workout. And I'm like, yeah, this is how, it, this is how it goes. The poop's not going anywhere. Yeah. Just pick it up right. when you're done. It's just going to stay there. We'll just open a window. The, <laughs> the kid is going to vacuum the dog. Hopefully he won't vacuum the poop and we're just going to keep going. And so I do my workout. And then by the time that's all done, my mind is like super stimulated for growth and productivity. And my anxiety goes, I wake up with anxiety. So my anxiety goes down with the exercise, mm-hmm. like the expansiveness in my mind and my heart from writing a few things out, having an action plan, getting some influence from someone else by reading for a few minutes, all those things. Like I cannot not be in a winning mindset by the time I'm done with all that. Even if I'm annoyed with the kid and the dog, I'm still like, Oh, come on day. Like bring it. What else do you have for me? Yeah. (laughs) I can manage any poop, any, like I'm I'm ready. (laughs) And I think that's so different than waking up to a baby screaming in a baby monitor or a three-year-old coming to your bed and, you know, fussing at you for something. So really it sets me up to be proactive versus reactive. And then from there, like once I'm done with my workout, then kind of the routine family things start to happen where it's like diving into the breakfast and the getting dressed and all those kinds of things, which can be chaos, but it's managed. I mean, it can be us at this point. (laughs) I'm not being bitchy about this, but I love it when I have a like single dude on the podcast who's like talking about his like hour meditation. I'm just like sitting back right. going like, damn, yeah. I don't even know what that's like. like an hour of meditation <laughs> and like it's doing my, my visualization and yeah. And <laughs> then I stretch for, for 30 minutes before I do my workout, which is another hour. And you're like, D-. I actually follow someone who preaches like, and I, he's great, but he's like middle-aged 40 year old single dude. And he has this amazing routine, but I'm like, no mom is going to like, she'd have to get up at like three 15 in the morning yeah. and try so, not yeah, to wake so, anybody up with the Tibetan singing bowls, you know, exactly, like, <laughs> exactly. you really have to find what works for you. And like, I say like, you if your morning routine is like getting out of bed and doing like three sun salutations before your kids wake up, that's fine. Like it can be three minutes, yeah. but just something that is about like you expanding your body, your mind, opening your heart and like letting you be the person who starts your day and letting it be on your terms. And I just think that's the key to it, whatever that might look like. Yeah, I do. I think it's totally about finding what works for you and and not listening to what you should do and, and how early you have to get up. It's like, for fuck's sake, get enough sleep. Like, that's <laughs> so important. Yes. So yeah, important. Yeah, definitely prioritize sleep. And, I and that's do- why I think 15 minutes isn't going to like dramatically change your sleep. I agree with you. I get up, I even get up, I try to get up 10 minutes before my kids have to get up and my daughter usually gets up at the same time. But it's, you know, there is something to be said too for 
toddlerhood. And I felt like we really turned a corner when our kids, so I have two kids, two years apart. When they turned five and seven, I feel like we turned a corner and I got a lot of my life back. And I know, you know, now we're entering, well, we're not entering, like my son's going to be 11 shortly. And, you know, we're entering that phase, but it just, the, the quote unquote hard parts of it change. They don't go yeah. away. I think they change, but I have felt like now I can actually have some time on my own. Whereas before it was hard, just the constant interruptions and right. yeah, anyway, but get enough sleep, have some kind of morning routine, even if it's just five minutes. Well, just like, even if your morning routine, like after they go to school or preschool or daycare and you go, go home, like do it then. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. That works. Absolutely. And the thing is you have a morning routine right now, no matter like, regardless of whether or not you recognize it as such. And so like you said, you realize, you're like, oh, my morning routine is turning off the lights. So you already have a morning routine, no matter what you do. And so you, what you need to consider is, does your current morning routine serve you? Yeah. Does it serve you to have the kinds of days you want to be having and working toward a, the kind of life you want to be living? Because maybe it does, but also like, could you make a change that would only take a few minutes that would change the course of your day, which if you change the course of enough days, it does change the course of your life. Yeah. Yes. I love that personal development quote slash cliche <laughs> slash powerful statement. <laughs> yes. Well, speaking speaking of power, and this is this this next part's for the moms. What power do you see in motherhood that many of us are missing? Oh, this is such a good question. I have to say, this is some of my response to this is inspired by an interview I did with Julia Freeland on my show. And she talked about, she works very specifically about moms or with moms who are reentering the workforce. Mm -hmm. And she trains moms to be way more intentional about how they market themselves. And it's not about like, she's really clear, like this isn't about stretching the truth or like, you know, kind of fakely boosting your resume. This is very legitimate, like finding your value as a mother. And then how can that also make you a valuable CEO? And this is not stretching the bound, like stretching the lines of truth at all. When she talks very specifically about like, if you are especially, oh my gosh, if you're home with like a one-year-old and a three-year-old, like you would have been at one time, you know, you have two little tiny kids, everything is a shit show. Mm -hmm. So you are a master in managing chaos in conflict negotiation. Like you literally could write a middle Eastern peace treaty. Yeah. You are. That was the right when I started my business, Sarah. Oh my gosh. When I launched our kick-ass life, Sydney had just turned one and Colton had just turned three. It was a fucking nightmare. <laughs> right, right. So if you look back, if the skills gained from that, you're like, there's nothing you could not do because mm-hmm. you got through that time. But if you're not really conscientious of like, wow, look at those things that I did. And because of that, that means that I can like, do, you know, I can get 33 things done in 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. I, can I, to, be, yeah. I can be totally focused in the middle of like major chaos. I can prioritize, like, here's the three things I need to do to make money today that will get me closer to a specific revenue goal. And here's the 37 things that I'm going to say no to today because th- it might be nice for my kids to have clean clothes, but also is that going to make me money? Probably not. So they can wear the peanut butter clothes. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. like, being re- so all those, all of those attributes really, really make you more valuable in your professional journey and in womanhood and standing in your power and like actually having these like really amazing skill sets. But oftentimes we don't look at those things. Oftentimes we're like, all I do is manage the chaos. And all I do is like, you know, keep track of doctor's appointments and dinner time and all these other things. Well, the thing is like, no offense dudes, but if you could see inside all the compartments of a mother's brain and all the things that we can manage and turn on and off at any given point, it's fucking magic. And you can't do that unless you've had to live through that. And I mean, especially if you have like a child with special needs and the things that you have to compartmentalize for that also like off the, uh, off the charts in terms of your capabilities. And so really looking at how does motherhood make you more powerful and how can you embrace that rather than getting caught up in like, I'm just living in a shit show and it's just really crazy all the time. And like, mm-hmm. really and like embracing the busy badge, like, well, everything's just so crazy and busy. And I'm always such a hot mess. The actually no, yeah. <laughs> I, like take off your freaking busy badge because you could actually like reframe that to be like, actually, no, instead of wearing my busy badge, I'm really capable at managing a lot of different things at one time. And I'm really capable of organizing in a certain way so that like everything can be done in the way that it needs to be done so that every, everyone gets what they need out of a certain situation. Those are actually really valuable skills. And when you frame it that way, instead of like, Oh my God, I'm 
was just such a hot mess. Like that puts you in a position of power. And when you, yeah, to, yeah. totally, mm-hmm. totally. I can't stand. And I mean, I will say that there are times when I show up to a conference call and I'm like, Oh my God, I'm, you know, today's crazy. And I have to catch myself and be like, no, like it's not crazy. You are managing it the best you can. And there's power in that. And so don't show up and say everything's so crazy and it's so busy and I'm a hot mess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's like you were saying, like it's, it is about the language that we use and, and that, yeah. that shapes us, I think more than we actually know. And I, yeah, I went through a phase for a couple of years there where it was, it was, I wore the busy badge and I was, I was also really mad at my husband and it wasn't his fault. It was, you know, because I remember we had one argument one time where I had thrown myself on the couch face down crying, you know, like I just started the business and it was so difficult and I refused to get daycare for them because I was having like, you know, the guilt, just guilt ridden. I I, I should be able to do both of this, like this nap time thing that was like totally not working out. And (laughs) I can do, I can work a 40 hour work during during a a two hour nap once a day. (laughs) And then when, yeah. And then when Colton was two and a half, Sydney was six months old, he decided he was done with naps and, and, and and really has been, he's just one of those kids that just stopped napping early. And it was, it was rough there for a while. And anyway, we got this argument. And I was like, I'm like, I bet you don't even know what size shoe Colton wears. <laughs> and it was just, and he did it, but it was, it was one of those uh, things. Like I wanted to prove to him, like how much it was constantly in my brain all the time. And my yes. friend Amy calls me the Owen family ops manager, because that's, basically, you know, the role that I had taken on. And I don't even know what my point was with this whole story, except that I wanted to complain about it and feel better about myself. But (laughs) I totally agree. My husband showed up late to our son's birthday party this year. And I was like, (laughs) you know what? Like I had left a little early to get reserved these tables at a park. And I had told him when to come. And he had like been part of deciding what time the party should be uh, like three weeks prior or whatever. So all of a sudden it's like the party's starting and he's not there. And I'm texting him and he's like, well, I'm leaving the house in a few minutes. And I was like, dude, the party, he's like, well, I started, thought it started at three 30. I was livid because it started at three. <laughs> so he showed up and I was like, I'm no longer responsible for your calendar. I will not tell I'm you not where to be. Mm-hmm. I will put it on the calendar. I will send you an invite through Gmail. Yeah. You can do with that yep, what you will, same thing. but <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. Parallel you can life. miss your kid's birthday party. That's fine. That's on you. <laughs> we have been through that same thing where I resigned. I'm like, I am not your manager anymore. <laughs> I am certainly not your mama. And no, we do the same thing. Gmail invites. I have a, I have a wall calendar where it's like, cause we have, now we have swim practice on different nights and I, I have been guilty of like switching things up and not telling him. And he's like waiting for us at the pool. And I'm like, Oh, sorry, we're at home. <laughs> but um, <laughs> no, the point, my point was, is that what I learned from that whole experience and continue to learn is that I have to be flexible. And that is rough for somebody who has built her life on control and predictability and (laughs) that, those type of things where it's like, you have to be flexible. And I had a coach early on and one of the, my favorite things that, that I took away from Gina Gabellini would always ask me, cause I would always come to come to the calls like, Oh my God, like drama all the time. And, (laughs) and it was just a fucking emergency all the time. And she's like, Andrea, what if it wasn't that big of a deal? Yeah, And it wasn't that she was saying it's not that big of a deal. She was asking me and like putting the power on myself. Like, what if you change the perspective? Like what would change in your life if you made it not such a big deal? Cause I was making it a big deal. Right. Right. Yeah. I, and I know, I mean, there's people in my life that live from one emergency to the next for sure. And yeah, at a certain point you have to like, that becomes a choice and not to say mm-hmm. that there's not like very legitimate big things that come up in life. But if you are constantly living from one, like if you were living in an adrenaline rush, whether it's in your immediate family or with your extended family or in your work environment, like at some, a certain point that's on you to Mm -hmm. decide that like, I am not, I'm, I am opting out of the adrenaline rush and reframing, either reframing it or changing some boundaries in your life so that that's not happening anymore. Yes. So much. Yes. Okay. So indirectly related, talk to us about living reactive versus proactive and why this is significant for not just, you know, peace and ease in life, but for our growth and power. Yeah. So we talked about like starting off your day in a certain way, starting off your day in that proactive place where it's, you're starting on your own terms, you're starting before the rest of the household gets up, whatever that might, might look like from you. So that's one way of being 
proactive versus reactive. Another way, so I just, I recently did an episode called the seven phrases of freedom and people have been really excited about it. And I thought it was like such a cute little catchy phrase when I thought of it, I was like, Ooh, seven phrases of freedom. But what people have really loved about it is it actually gives you some of the phrases give you really specific ways to be proactive. And so one of them is um, like when someone asks you to do something and I talked about, you know, someone invites you to do something, let's say on Saturday night and some coworkers like, Hey, you should like, we're doing karaoke at this club on, you know, downtown on Saturday. Do you want to come? And you're like, Oh my God, the last thing I want to do on Saturday is hang out with my coworkers doing karaoke. Now, some people might think that sounds like a dream, but there's a lot of people that would like rather die. So my struggle with these things used to always be like, well, I'd feel like I needed to have like a really valid excuse and like share a really big story. Like I would wish I could, but I can't because I have like these 13 things and then I have this other one thing. And I was then I have, traumatized like, by a karaoke experience one time. Right. <laughs> Not over it. And so you're like making up like all this stuff that's like half truths to like get out of something. And, and that's a very reactive response. And so my, the proactive response would be, first of all, like when someone throws that to you face to face, especially, and you're like caught off guard and you're like, oh shit, what do I say? To just say, Hey, let me get back to you. Mm-hmm. And you could do that over, you know, they, someone might text you something, someone might email you something. They might say it face to face, but anytime you're where you're like going into that place of like, I really don't want to do that, but I don't know how to get out of it. And I'm an obliger or a people pleaser who generally just says yes. And then regrets it like every minute after the yes, just say, can I get back to you about that? And then you can think for a minute about like, okay, do I really want to do this? Yes or no. And then when you do get back to them, you can also be proactive and saying like, yes, I'd love to, or no, I can't. Like no is a complete sentence. You don't need to say no, I can't because of these 18 and a half reasons. Just Mm -hmm. no, I no, that's not going to work. Or you can say like, yes, that sounds great, but you can be you, there's little ways that you can use little phrases that give you the power rather than giving the other person the power. And especially for people who are obligers and people pleasers, we very much feel like we need to immediately respond to something and immediately react. And I mean, I am so guilty of this. Like a text comes in. I treat texts like 911 calls. Like if someone texts me, I'm like, oh my God, they need me right now because I'm very important. And so how can I help them? And like, I have to check myself and be like, dude, <laughs> That's okay. girl, yeah. whatever, mm-hmm. like you are not, you're not that important. And also like they can wait. And if you're setting up, you know, it, it's, it's, this is how some of us live in a constant drama and chaos is because we become the person that's so reactive and responsive to everything that people react to that. So they're always honest about things. Yeah. They're like, Ooh, you know, who could help us with this? Sarah could help. And I actually just recently in signing it, my son starting in kindergarten in the fall and we had to, we got him into a private school and we went through this like whole thing. And basically like I secret baptized him to get him into the school and like all it's fairly hilarious, the lengths that I went to. But then because I was like, well, I want to make sure that like they're happy about giving us a spot or whatever. Like it sounds so dumb when I say it out loud. I want to make sure they feel good about their decisions in admitting my son. So I was like, what can I, how can I volunteer? So I've already like partially committed to like three volunteer things. Kindergarten moms are the best at that. (laughs) I caught myself. So we had a kindergarten meeting last week where the, like the, their equivalent of the PTA heads came in and we're asking people to get involved. They were like, so if you're interested, just come up and talk to us afterwards. And I like out of nowhere, I'm like, well, my husband's like, you're going to go talk to them afterwards, aren't you? And I was like, of course. And then later I was like, why? (laughs) And I did, I did go talk to them and I almost committed to something, but I caught myself and I said, okay, I'm going to think about that. And I'll reach out through the website and let you know what I decide. So I got myself out of it. Bought yourself some time. But then we were driving Mm -hmm. home and I'm like, why out of like 30 parents was I the one that was like, oh, I'm going to make sure I definitely check in with them. Like, how am I more obligated than anyone else? So I now have decided like, okay, I know how much I want to give in terms of volunteer hours per week. And I, and I have a better sense of what that's going to look like. And that means I'm going to say no to some of those things I kind of partially already said yes to. And I'm going to go back and say, actually, here's where I want to prioritize my giving to the school. And that's going to be like in reading, tutoring, and the hot lunch program, because those things are things that I think will, I actually might have some skills and value to add. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I need to be like procuring items for the auction. That's not my jam. So. Oh yeah. Such important lessons. And I think, th- I think in the, in the, the community, there's some people pleasers and, and obligers. And, and I love that. I think I, I think I wrote about that in my 
first book about in the people pleasing chapter about how to say no, but to, you know, buy yourself some time and like other yeah. things that you, for people, cause some people like going A to Z, like starting to say no, that's just way too much. So, so pausing, terrible. asking, you know, when do you need to know by, yeah. I have to check with my calendar or my partner, like those type of things. And then, you know, that's not an out, like you still need to say no, but it just buys you some time. Right. Right. And that's, that's, I think where you have to be, that gets you out of reactive mode when you just buy yourself time. Cause then you can have a more thoughtful response Yeah, and also train people that you're not someone that commits on the spot all the time. Like, don't, yep. don't be that person. Like, we all know that person. Mm-hmm. And that's the person that wears their busy badge around with like a freaking trophy. And it, <laughs> it's not cool. Oh my gosh. Okay. So shamelessmom.com, everybody, that's where Sarah hangs out. She also has a podcast of the same name. And is there anything else that you want to say before we wrap it up today? So you can find everything over at shamelessmom.com and through your podcast app um, at the Shameless Mom Academy for the podcast. I actually have a 15 minute manifest, which is like how to integrate a morning routine. And that's at shamelessmom.com forward slash 15 mm. Perfect. Thank you so much for being on the show. This has been so fun. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it, Andrea. And thank you everyone for listening. I know how important and valuable your time is and I do not take that for granted. Thank you so, so, so much for being here. And until next time, I will see you all out in cyberspace. Bye-bye. 